if you have an organization that's not using artificial intelligence, it's going to go out of business. And that's going to be a widespread job loss. Uh, when some other company, some other organization uses artificial intelligence. And the, the reasons are not, you know, particularly evil or <laughs> they're just, it's a cost-based argument. That if they can do things faster, um, cheaper, I mean, this, we're, we're in the context of faster, cheaper standardization. And, it, and if another company can do things faster and cheaper, including knowledge work, I mean, what we're talking about here is, is largely in physical, mechanical work. What's interesting is my knowledge work here, but people are going to lose their jobs. Good evening and welcome to the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation. My name is Bob Perry and I'm the museum's director. Um, I'm very happy to welcome both an in-person audience and an online audience that's watching this live. Uh, this event is being live streamed by the WGBH Forum Network and uh, it also will be uh, something that you can watch again later. So if you missed something, want clarification, or you just loved it so much you can't get enough, I know that's going to happen. Um, so tonight's Mill Talk is about artificial intelligence or AI. and. Of course, AI is not just about research and writing, as our speaker will well explain. But in preparation for my role this evening, I decided to take an intentional AI plunge myself for the very first time. Uh, intentional, because we're all actually using AI uh, all the time, unintentionally. You probably knew that, but if you didn't, you're going to learn a lot about that tonight. I registered for Microsoft's recent acquisition, OpenAI's ChatGPT application, which is now a wildly popular AI tool that helps people research and write. I've heard the wonder, the superlatives, the astonishment over ChatGPT, and with tonight's event on the schedule, it was clearly time uh, for me to give it a try, and I too am fairly amazed, I must say. Um, I gave it four topics to research and write, and what I'll read to you next, other than the headers, all of it is unedited product of ChatGPT, and honestly, I think it's pretty good. Um, to begin, here is ChatGPT's 100-word introduction to this museum. Nestled along the scenic banks of the Charles River in Waltham, Massachusetts, the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation stands as a tribute to the ingenuity and entrepreneurial spirit that fueled the Industrial Revolution. Housed within a historic 19th century textile mill, the museum offers visitors a captivating journey through time, exploring the evolution of technology and its profound impact on society. Though through immersive exhibits, interactive displays, and engaging programs, the museum chronicles the innovations of yesteryear, inspiring a deeper appreciation for the relentless pursuit of progress and the transformative power of human creativity in shaping the world we inhabit today. Wow. <clears throat> really? <laughs> It's mostly true. Um, I said, please uh, give me an introduction, a 100 word introduction to the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation. That was the almost immediate response. Uh, you may know that, uh, and we are very grateful that our mill talks are underwritten by a generous grant from the Lowell Institute. Here is ChatGPT's 50 word introduction of the Lowell Institute. The Lowell Institute, a beacon of learning and enlightenment in Boston, Massachusetts, has been fostering intellectual curiosity since its founding in 1836. Dedicated to providing free public lectures and educational programs, it continues to enrich minds and inspire lifelong learning, serving as a cornerstone of cultural and educational excellence. It's true and accurate, and um, I could not have written it better. Uh, when you signed up for tonight's event, you may have learned that our speaker co-hosts an excellent podcast, Me, Myself, and AI. Here's ChatGPT's 50-word introduction of that podcast. Me, Myself, and AI is a groundbreaking podcast that delves into the profound impact of artificial intelligence on our lives and society. Hosted by leading experts in AI and technology, each episode explores the ethical, social, and practical implications of AI, offering insightful analysis and thought-provoking discussions for listeners worldwide. And finally, our speaker. 
Uh, you were able to read a lengthy bio of Dr. Sam Ransbotham on our event page. Uh, so I know that you've had full access to his remarkable background. Here's ChatGPT's 50-word introduction of our speaker. Sam Ransbotham, esteemed professor at Boston College, is a luminary in the field of information systems and digital innovation. With a wealth of expertise in business analytics and technology management, his research illuminates the intersection of technology and strategy guiding organizations towards sustainable competitive advantage in the digital age. Wow. Um, interesting. No mention of AI. But plenty of that to come. Please welcome Dr. Sam Ransbotham. Hey, y'all. Is this good? All right. Thanks for coming and braving the, the rain tonight. Um, this is a relatively small group. I'm happy to talk about really whatever you want to talk about, uh, especially if it uses words like esteemed and luminary in it, which, you know, I'm not sure if I've ever rated esteemed or luminary. I think we should reemphasize those. Um, I got a bunch of slides here of stuff that I thought you might be interested in, but I didn't know what this audience would be. So, if you if your eyes start rolling like it's 8 a.m. and you're an undergrad, then I'll just move faster. And if you're if you perk up in your seat, we'll slow down and uh, and delve a little bit. Um, I'm about to start. You've all had this experience of of calling your bank. Okay, it's always a wonderful experience. Uh, you call your bank, and immediately what you get is this person trying to stop you from doing what you want. Now. It's, um, I like this picture because it looked like a gendarme, and I like to say gendarme because it makes me feel sophisticated and um, luminary and elite <laughs> and all the, all those uh, good words. Um, but they ask you things like, uh, what's your mother's maiden name? What's your pet's name? What's your et cetera, et cetera, all the things we keep on social media. Um, but why does it ask you that stuff? To annoy you? I don't think that's their primary objective. Uh, that may be a secondary accomplishment. Huh? Gatekeeping. Why do we want to gatekeep? I mean, it, wouldn't it be easier if we just let everybody call up and get straight to their money? I'm worried about people like you calling up and pretending to me, me and getting to my vast resources, right? So we, we endure this because we understand why it's happening. But it's expensive. It's expensive for you. It's expensive for the organization, for the bank, right? Well, let's think about what happens with artificial intelligence here. And I'm going to say we're going to have a new process here with artificial intelligence. And my first option is this option A. And if you can tell, I've replicated my tiny little gendarme, mostly so I can say gendarme again, um, a whole bunch of times. And this equivalent is the chat bot that you're used to. You call in and they say, what can I help you with today? And you say, a withdrawal, you say transfer, you say whatever it is you want. And then because, as you've noticed, I have a beautiful Southern accent, they asked me again, did you say reservations? Res I put, apparently I put too many syllables in these uh, words. It's the Agent Smith approach. Duplicate a bunch. <laughs> People like it. People like to do this approach. The banks like this approach. Why? What's it cost them to do this? Very than very little. It costs them, while it's running, it may take them some expense to get it set up, but while it's running, it costs electricity. And they can answer the phone almost immediately. It may not be helpful, but they can answer it immediately. So that's one approach, and that's pretty attractive for people. And I'll mention that as we go forward, uh, this transition from increasing the fixed cost to reduce the variable cost. Okay? Here's another option, though. A couple of other banks, HSBC, Fidelity, Barclays, are trying a different approach, which is as your call, you get a human immediately. And they say, what can I help you with? And then you say, I'd like to transfer money. While you're doing that, they're checking your voice print. And they're authenticating you through your prior voice interactions. I think that's interesting. Now, it's all opt-in and, and you know requires... Uh, requires them having a voice print of you from a prior interaction. Um, but I like it because, well, they know my beautiful Southern voice. It's nice, too, because if you think about what's happened here, 
it would be impossible to train every bank customer service agent to recognize the voice of every customer, right? That's just not going to, it's not going to work at scale, but the machine can do it and the machine can do it well and do it fast. But we also have, if you're paying attention here, a separation of the task. There really were two things going on here. There's the authentication process, verifying you're, you're who you say you are, and the what you want to do. It turns out the machine is extremely good at the authentication part, but it's extremely poor at the general what do you want to do part. They can give you about five options. If you don't say one of the five options that they've chosen, then you have to say them again and repeat them over and over again. Um, we've all been, been through that. Um, the machine can do other things. It's a little more subtle. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it's pretty fascinating. Um, if I claim to be calling to, into my bank account and I say, oh, I'm in Boston, I'm calling about my bank account, they can check the phone line latency. This is how long that phone line, you know, the, you know, the little gap when it gets too long and you start interrupting each other uh, <laughs> when, when people take too long to respond. They can check this. And if your phone line latency is showing that you're more profiling like you're thousands and thousands of miles away versus 20 miles away, I can't hear it in my voice. We can't hear it as humans, but the machine can pick up on it. And you may be traveling. There may be a perfectly legitimate reason that you're not in Boston calling about your account, but it can make a flag for that customer service agent to say, all right, let's check into this a little further because something is a little bit out of sync. The voice isn't matching the I think that's a really interesting, and I'm, you know, I'm going to say I like option B here. It's letting the machine do what the machine is good at while the human does what the human's good at. And that's, what can I help you with? Taking a general abstract problem and understanding it. We're still beating the machines on that one. Um, and this is not all sort of touchy-feely and free. They're not doing, they're saving about 10 to 20 seconds per call on authentication times. So, so there's, there's a financial incentive for them to do this as well. My overall point here, though, is that tools are agnostic. We can use a tool in many different ways. People decide how we use tools. People decide. And I think that's a really interesting uh, and important thing to pay, pay attention to here. So that's my first point. I got six total points. So we, some of them are longer points, though. So you don't, don't, get, don't get thinking you're going to get out early here. Um, Let's talk about these just technology decisions for a minute. Think about the first caveman that picked up a rock. Option A, could Zog could clock Grog on the head with the rock, right? And so this is a picture, cartoon picture, of a caveman clonking other caveman on the head with rock. Another option would be, could build a house with it. Use it as a hammer. Use it as a, uh, as a stone. The rock didn't know the difference. My analogy here is that these tools, these artificial intelligence tools that we're talking about, they don't know the difference either. They don't know if we use them for good and they don't know if we use them for bad. And that's still a huge role for human agency. All right, you have a protest? Beautiful, yes, yes. What's your clue that they're generated? He's got three legs. Yeah, it's a stable diffusion, yeah. <laughs> Our friend here has got three legs. All right, so am I, actually, although I gotta say, even with that, it's better than my artistic skills. Um, but I would, even I would have known not to put three legs. He also has fewer, fewer toes than we might. But the toe thing might be sort of a stylism. Um, guessing the three leg thing is not. It's a choice. It's a technology choice that we all have. Uh, sharp eyes there. Um, and actually, that also brings up, if you look at the bottom here, almost every... When I've got slides or numbers or reference material, at the bottom I'm, I've got uh, the URL where they came from if you're curious later. Okay, so we've been making these decisions for a long time about how to use technology. And this is, we have another big case coming along with artificial intelligence. Um, I think about this person who made fire the first time or discovered fire, invented fire. I don't, I don't know what you do with fire. I don't know what the right verb is for fire. Discovered fire because the fire existed. Um, I'm pretty excited about it, pretty warm, pretty happy about it. Um, I don't think that they were sitting there thinking, man, we're going to go to the moon someday because I found this fire thing. It is really difficult for us to imagine where technologies are going to lead when, when they come along because we, we think about them from our own frame of reference. 
um, probably using it for warmth, but immediately you can use it for light, right? So I don't think we'd be reading and writing like we do now if we, if we didn't have some method of using candles. Uh, we see cars here left and right. Um, I don't think that cars were going through a uh, caveman Zog's uh, mind at the time, or I don't think rockets were. Now, these are just, it's really hard to more imagine what we're going to be able to do with technologies here. And I think that's where we are right now with these technologies that are coming up with artificial intelligence. Uh, we can guess, but we can't really know. All right. Point two, it's really difficult to know what these new technologies will spark. Anybody complaining? Well, I'm over one third of the points here, but the, my, my later points get bigger. So don't, don't, all right. This is a chart, actually Bob sent me this chart and I, I liked it a lot. Um, so I decided to incorporate it here. Um, what it is here is a, the gross in the, in the global gross domestic product. So kind of measuring how much act economic activity there is. Um, and we have time scale across the bottom. So from the year 1000, I guess the research didn't go back any further than 1000 uh, to right about now. <clears throat> and it's trillions of, let's say dollars. Uh, this is a Geary Hamann dollars, which is an economic thing. Um, and it's a logarithmic scale. So this, this little shooty up thing you see here, it's even more shooty up. It's, it's orders of magnitude shooty up. Shooting up is a technical term. Um, all right. So what you see here is some revolutions that have come along, some technology revolutions. Uh, you're, I mean, I'm going to point out a couple of them. Printing press came along. That's kind of a big deal. Um, you know, you see, they've got some nice charts here about the, you know, the magnitude of GDP increase over the next decade from when these technologies came along. Um, I can't help but mention steam engines sitting in this, in this context here. Um, Big deal, uh, moving the, the to where we could run the belts off the steam engines versus the direct drive from the mill right outside. Um, transistors is a fascinating for me. Transistors is fascinating for me because it, it's this 1955 and Bell Labs. It's a big deal, and I am not terribly sure that people like students in the year 3000 when they're copying Wikipedia for an essay like they're going to be doing are not going to be thinking about, man, that transistor and the same word that they talk about wheel and fire. I mean, this is a, a huge deal and it's happened while we're paying attention to it. Now, what people are excited about is artificial intelligence and is that in here. Now, this is a little I'm snark on this graph a little bit. You can put any technology in here on this line when it was invented. It's not establishing a causal relationship here, but we can squint and think about the things that these technologies enabled and allow them to go forward. All right. So the question is, is this going to be even more hockey stick? Are we going to have to double log this Y axis here to, to make it fit on the screen? Good. Okay. Keep going here. I'm a professor. As a professor, we have to give quizzes. So here's my first quiz for you. There'll be more coming later. Um, how much are you personally using AI right now? And I say on your job, and I say on your job because I asked this to about 6,000 people around the world, and I have their answers here in a minute. Um, think about it for a minute. You have to anchor in. Key in asking a question in class is forcing people to anchor in. If you were in class, I'd make you write it down on a piece of paper so that you, you instantiate it and you commit to it. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the, I'm, I'm going to let you off the hook here and just say, here's what our respondent said. 66% of the people said that they were not using artificial intelligence. Minimal or no use. Does that feel right? Why not? What's the... Just... Right, there, there's the tricky part. Fortunately, we had the sense to come along right after this question and ask another question and say, hey, well, you know, what about these things? Have you used these things? I go, oh, well, yeah, we, I use that all the time. <laughs> use that all the time. So 43, half those people immediately recognize that, oh, no, my first answer was completely wrong. And I think that is part of the insidious nature of a technology revolution, is that it just gets pervasive pretty quickly. How many people here came with GPS? I did. I mean, it's like, I'm not sure how we navigated before, right? Um, 
I'll mention the sextant later as a way of navigating. But the point here is that these things are just insidious, and we take them for granted. If you if I gave you, if you, let's say you're someone living in 1700s, and I gave you a quill, and your quill you were writing, and the ink would turn red if you misspelled a word. Witchcraft, right? I mean, I think up in Salem they did some stuff about that, right? That's craziness. Does spell check strike any of you as craziness right now? That's not even AI, right? That couldn't be AI because it's just so normal. We get very used to technologies uh, and how quickly they go. Yeah. The only things that don't work is spell check. Exactly, exactly. Uh, one of my, actually, I don't have a slide on this, but uh, I cut it out for time, which you're going to be surprised at when I talk for three hours here. But one of the fun things is most of the definitions of artificial intelligence say something like AI is doing things that normally didn't require uh that required humans without humans doing intelligent things one it always has intelligence on both sides and we're not very good at defining intelligence so we put it on both sides of the equal sign which is a mathematical foul um, but we use the word normally a lot because if it works it can't be ai all right yeah so we asked that and if you're curious about well, there's a whole bunch more questions that we ask here and got some urls at the bottom if you're curious um the problem is, actually, I think one of the phrases using AI is a problem. Like, I know what it means to use a stapler. I, of course, have a red stapler because uh, the Office Space movie. People know when they're using a stapler. You're, you're, it's pretty obvious you got a stapler in your hand. You don't have to understand how a stapler works. You just squeeze the thing and it puts a staple in it. Um, and stapling kind of means the same thing everywhere to everybody all the time. So that I think that's a problem. Like, we don't think about using AI in that way because it's not like a stapler even though we use the same verbs. I did an interview, uh, Bob mentioned the podcast. We've done some interviews with people, and this is Fiona Tan, who at the time was the CTO of Wayfair. And I've noticed as I've done these slides that I think everybody that I have in the slide no longer is in their position that they were when I interviewed them. I'm not sure if that's causal. <laughs> we're putting people out of their jobs. Maybe they're getting promoted because of it. Um, but what she said was, hey, people don't come in every to work every morning and go, hey, I think I sure would like to use some artificial intelligence today. You know, they're looking to, to do things. They're not looking to use tools. All right. So my third point is that there's widespread use of artificial intelligence, but widely varying types, degrees of awareness and how people are using it. Good. All right. Only four more hours. Okay. As we think about this, most of the time people will say, oh my gosh, the robots are coming to take our jobs. And that's a, a common fear. Um, I think that fear makes sense, but I think it's misguided because there are two things you should be more afraid of right now than the AI coming to take your job. Um, so in case you weren't sleeping right now, here's two things that I think are more important. First, other humans that are better at using artificial intelligence are going to take your job before the machine takes your job. That's just path of least resistance. I mean, we know about the diffusion of technology innovation from Ever Rogers and uh, thousands of books on this. But the point here is that we doesn't have to be replaced by a machine for you to get affected by artificial intelligence. It can be a human using it. Um, there's a great quote, uh, Pedro Dominguez, who's a professor at Washington. Um, I think he's still a professor, so that's okay. I didn't put him out of a job. Um, AI then will not replace managers, but managers with AI will replace managers without it. Um, a similar quote here from Eric Benioffson, who's no longer at MIT. He was at MIT when I, when I talked to him about this. People using AI are starting to replace people who don't, and that trend is just going to continue. I think that is a salient worry. And I have to put a little slightly thing in parentheses here that I love both these quotes that they're not talking about technology as the actor. I have a particular peeve. Um, one of the things that we edit out of our podcast is people saying AI does X because the technology does nothing. It's like saying the rock does something or the hammer does something. No, the person holding the hammer, the person using the technology does something. And then both of these quotes are, are spot on with that human agency. All right, so that's the first thing that you ought to really worry about is other people using the technology better than you. Second thing, if you have an organization that's not using artificial intelligence, it's going to go out of business. And that's going to be a widespread job loss. Uh, when some other company 
some other organization uses artificial intelligence. And the, the reasons are not, you know, particularly evil or <laughs> they're just, it's a cost-based argument that if they can do things faster, um, cheaper, I mean, this, we're, we're in the context of faster, cheaper standardization. And, it, and if another company can do things faster and cheaper, including knowledge work, I mean, what we're talking about here is, is largely in physical, mechanical work. What's interesting is about knowledge work here, but people are going to lose their jobs. One of the things our research found, though, we also asked people, and this was an afterthought that we asked it, and I'm so glad we did. 60% of the people who responded to our survey felt like the tool was kind of like a coworker. That is not the sort of feeling that people have with people who are going to, the robot who's going to kick them out of their job. And I think part of the reason for that is that most people are overworked. <laughs> They've got too much to do. They have, we are all from, Jay-Z and Oprah Winfrey down to me, we are fundamentally limited by 24 hours a day. There's just nothing that we're going to be able to, to do to, to change that. And this is offering some opportunities to get more done per unit time. All right. <clears throat> that was perhaps a little too optimistic, though. I've got this picture, and this is actually a relatively dated picture now. Um, it's about making sneakers. Produces 2,400 shoes in eight hours. And that would require 200 people. That's exactly the sentiments that people had when they were assembling the watch screws upstairs that we were just looking at. This is the sentiment. And there was a strike. I was just reading about, uh, I lost my track where I am. This is the strike over here um, was around these types of ideas. And what are we going to do? If all those people lose work, who's going to buy those sneakers? These are not trivial tasks because it's not going to be the same as saying, all right, last week you were a sneaker assembler. This week you're going to be an AI expert. That's, that's, very, that's not going to be an easy transition for people. So while there may be a, a net no change in jobs as these technologies create new, job, new opportunities for people, it's, it's not always going to be the same person that loses a job and gains a job. Um. I'm, I'm, I realize now I'm mentioning my son twice today, and I only mention my son. He really likes plain. He used to like plain hamburgers, like not hamburgers. He liked bread and cheese and bread. That's what he wanted. And if I go to the kiosk, if I go to the person here and try to explain that to them, they roll their eyes because they don't understand why would anybody ever do that. And it takes about five minutes. And as I'm waiting and doing that and telling his order. I can feel the eyes of the people behind me, but like, like, what is this guy's problem? He needs to get going. I got important stuff to do. Now I go to this kiosk and I can put in exactly what I want and get it. I don't know if you've been somewhere that's, uh, like been traveling somewhere. If you walk to this kiosk, there's a button in the corner that switches it to English and Spanish and French and hundreds of other languages. And that again is a second evidence in our hey, we're switching fixed cost and variable cost because you can't have this person trained to understand hundreds of languages. But if you make a fixed cost investment in the technology, you can scale that technology out cheap. There's a lot, I mean, people like this because these things don't go to the bathroom. They don't have health insurance. They very appealing here. Um, I really should work this in better. The, the truth is I just kind of like this picture. Um, and I really don't have a good point with it other than I just love the idea of how sheepish this robot looks caught looking and <laughs> at cats versus doing his important charts. Um, I said that the robots didn't go to the bathroom or take breaks. Well, maybe, maybe they did. All right. This is not a hypothetical problem. In Amazon warehouses right now, they have these little gizmos that go underneath the stack of or what you call that, shelves, pick it up, move the shelf to the person, and they move the right shelf to the right place all the time. I find that fascinating because one of our very first jobs was in a lighting store, and I would go around and fulfill orders for chandeliers and stuff. And knowing where things were in that store was a huge, like for the first three weeks, I was lost. I kind of had to walk down every aisle looking, looking, matching part numbers. Um, this thing doesn't look down. Part numbers is productive on day one. Amazon has exploded in their use of robots. But not so much with people. Yeah. Yeah.
in my lighting job, they, when I was a kid and, and tinier, they used to make me climb up to the top of the shelves because I was probably more expendable and less, more pliable. Yeah. So this is happening. You know, this is, you got to think that if Amazon was going to grow like Amazon had grown, they would have had to hire a lot more people uh, to achieve that same level of growth um, without robots. So it's not hypothetical. This is right now. Um, what's interesting, though, is it's also switched from being them to us. I don't know about you. I, I was not hoping to become a sneaker manufacturer, so that sneaker manufacturer assembler slide didn't really hit home for me. I, you know, I did work in a warehouse, but I did not think of that as my, my career. But being a judge, that's a human intellectual activity. And this Ars Technical article talks about how they're just as good at predicting with models what a judge will do um, as a human will do. That's a human task, not, a, not one we think of as typically machine. Um, and then I found this and got a little sad. It's not just them. It's not just us. It's me. So in 2017, I think, yeah, the World Economic Forum came to this prediction that by 2030, students will be learning faster from robot teachers than from, from human teachers. And in 2017, when I first read this, that was, that, that was a long time ago way. In 2024, that's feeling a lot closer than it, than it did at the time. I can see this. I'll come back to this in a second um, because it, it, the, the fundamental truth of it makes sense to me uh, that it is really difficult. Peer-to-peer -peer individual teaching works, but it doesn't scale. You can't do it in a classroom, and I'll talk about this in just a second. All right. I think you've heard a lot about generative AI. It seemed, it seemed like Bob has spent some time playing with ChatGPT recently here. Um, What's been interesting, computers have always been good at math. So this is a sequence of numbers. What's the next number? Wait to see if we have any Rain Man type people here in the All right, it's tough. We could do it. We, 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 we could do it, but it's, it's difficult. Actually, that number is 1,048,576. Yeah, <laughs> done it before. <laughs> I had to look that up ahead of time. You can check me and see if I'm right. Maybe I mistyped it. Uh, and I can assure you I didn't do it by paper and, and by hand. Um, computers really good at this, always have been very good at this. Not surprising. We're not very good at it. Um, now, what about this problem? So this is a sequence. This is the Leland Stanford's uh, horse sequence. Uh, this is a first one of the first moving pictures. And your goal is to predict what picture goes here. Is it this picture or this picture? Pretty. You, you got it immediately, right? I mean, it, it wasn't even taxing. In fact, it's so easy that you're doing the undergrad thing right now where you're wondering if I'm trying to trick you, right? <laughs> Nobody will answer a, a simple question because it's, it's this, the prop is going gonna, gonna, to... No, I'm, there's, there's no trick here. This is the easy, dead simple answer, and we got it instantly much, much harder for a machine. Now, machines actually can do this at this point, but it's not like the mathematical program that I just showed you before. We are, we are as beings, amazingly good at predicting patterns and sequences. If I'm talking, saying a bunch of words, you immediately know what the next is gonna be. It didn't tax you at all, did it, right? All right. That's exactly what's happening here with this new, these new tools of generative AI that uh, um, I'm going to make fun of Bob's uh, uh, chat GPT use here slightly in that it all felt a little generic to me. And it all felt like stuff that it probably could have just Googled, right? It didn't have to generate that text as much as it just had to find that text. Um, now, Here's our exercise here. I've started, this is my first sentence. It's a very first small sentence here. Um, it has a blank here. If you had to guess, based on your years of experience, what the next word is, what would you guess? Actually, out of this total, I'm, I'm limiting our dictionary to seven words. The, open, closed, muddy, lonely, unicorn, or very. Which is, what's the word you're going to pick here? No other information. The. Why? 
sentences in English start with the. Statistically speaking, if you have to, you know, bet on something, you're going to bet on the. So if I was going to think about the predictive probabilities of the next word here, I'd say, well, 90% of the time it's going to be the. There's some sentences that open here, you know, that have these things, but, and I've made up these numbers. Don't, don't, these are, these are not real numbers. These are stylized numbers here. All right, so let's take this. I'm going to show you a series of other sentences. The bank was money. <laughs> All right. Okay. So I hear a lot of opens and closed, right? Feels like it fits. We recognize that pattern. Okay. And yeah, I think I agree with you. I mean, it could be the bank was the worst experience I've ever had in my life, but also very likely it's open or closed. Um, maybe I'm showing a positive bias here towards banks by being open. Um, it probably not a unicorn. That's what's happening when, what's that? It could be very crowded. So very, very still in the running here. All right. What about so frustrating the bank was? All right. So what happened was your Bayesian update. You did a Bayesian update. You took the prior, the posterior prior of what you had heard before. And you said, I'm going to update this to say, all right, now, because of this frustrating, because of this tone, because of a look back that we knew in the sentence, we can upstate and say, all right, closed is pretty likely. Muddy's muddy possible, yeah. Uh, unicorn is still not in the running here. My shoes are ruined. So frustrating, the bank was muddy. Yeah, that's the previous one. Yeah. So here's the point. This is what these tools are doing right now. Now, I have obviously grossly simplified what's happening here, but these are predictive updates of what's happening and what the next word is most likely to be. Now, they've gotten incredibly fancy. Their dictionary has more than seven words, of course. Um, the patterns are, that they're learning are in the trillions of parameters. But this is the, the core idea about what's happening. Actually, they're uh, there's memory, you know, the closer something is, the more likely it is to be salient. Um, actually some of the recent ones, BERT is bi-directional. That's what the B in BERT is, uh, bi-directional. Actually, for some reason, all these models are named after Sesame Street characters. There's Ernie and BERT. Um, BERT is bi-directional. Um, looking to say, okay, if I put this word in, how well would it fit going the other way? Anyway. All right. That's a, a little bit of a story here about the bank was, but and so what happened was, you know, statistically speaking, bank probably meant um, financial institution when you first think about it, but it could easily be a river bank, and because we have cognates there, there are probably other words for banked. All right, but that's what's happening when you're looking at Chat GPT, series of blanks, series of blanks, series of blanks, uh, over and over again, backwards and forwards, trying to get a cohesive set of of thoughts together. Okay. But actually, how many people here have used ChatGPT, played with it? All right, this is not the greatest audience for that question because uh, you're, you've come to spend a rainy night talking about artificial intelligence. So, so you're, you're a little bit biased here. But there's a Pew study that came out October this year, last year, um, that said that most people have not used it and few think it will have a major impact on their job. I would love to see these numbers updated. Um, I pulled one, there's several interesting charts in this, and the URL is at the bottom here. Um, one of the things I'll point out is, let's look at this one. They don't survey people less than 18, but if they did, I can, I can extrapolate as to how that would go. And actually, based on my sample size of two uh, 13 and 15 year olds, uh, they are all over this technology. It, it's amazing. And, I, and certainly we see it in the classrooms all the time. Um, when I see charts like this, I immediately think about the divide that's going to happen in our society between the technology haves and the technology have-nots. And that's technologies are just never universally <laughs> benefiting everybody. Somebody's always benefits more, somebody benefits less. Anyway, this fascinating study. Um, what are people using generative for? Um, I probably have too many slides here for this. Uh, this is an interview I did with McDad. Uh, Jaffer, actually, ironically, who just today announced that he moved to open AI. So yet another one in my list of people that are no longer. So he worked. Yep. 
It's basically, yeah, you, you might need a new job and come talk to me. Uh, they're all employed, by the way. There's not, they've lost jobs. Um, so Shopify, you may not quite be familiar with it, but it's a, it's a plumbing and infrastructure for e-commerce. And so what happens when people set up an e-commerce site, they have to fill out lots of product descriptions. What Shopify did early, ChatGPT came out in something like October, November. They had this product in place in February where it was when you were filling out your description of your product, you'd show it a picture and it would generate the text. It'd give you five or six different versions and it would let you pick which one you liked and it'd edit and adjust it. Massive value. I save people 30 seconds over and over and over and over again as they set up a giant website. They're saving 30 seconds a time. I think that's what's pretty fascinating here. So that's an example of uh, uh, one product that was literally in production. Here, go ahead. Need some wall errors in the text, but see. Yeah, so actually, I have something about human errors and vision coming up here in a second, but. We're not perfect is, is part of the thing. We, we make mistakes too. Um, and so it reminds me of there used to be some studies about Wikipedia versus Encyclopedia Britannica, and those did not go well for Encyclopedia Britannica. I mean, just because anybody can edit Wikipedia doesn't mean they don't. But I don't have a good, like, concrete number for you on that. It'd be interesting. Um, what else are people doing? Um, generating audio. I, you saw that I generated these images here with stable diffusion and generate audio. Uh, perfect for elevator music <laughs> if you need some background music um, code I don't know if you're coders but so much code is on the internet and it's very easy to scrape and copy and paste in and tools like copilot are doing that right now um, it I've done this actually I did it with a with a PyTorch vision model and the code was okay it was bad it wouldn't work but it was good enough to where I didn't have to start with a blank screen. I don't know about you, but I'm very good at telling about things I don't like about something, but the blinking white cursor is intimidating to me. And so it generated a bunch of code that I knew was not right, but I started to rearrange it and fix it. And I think it did save a bunch of time. Um, video, you want videos of your sales product out there? Companies will do it. Let's say I'd like a, a, a woman, the X age, X you know, look, and they will generate it talking about your product. So what it means is if you come to a website and this type of person is going to appeal to you, they can make that the salesperson. Just a matter of figuring out what, <laughs> which, which is going to give you a better sales lift. Um, style, I need this one. Uh, Barks and Spencer, they'll, they'll tell you what to buy. Um, we've got a podcast episode coming out. Um, uh, about this, not with Marks and Spencer, with a with a different company, Stitch Fix. They're talking about you know, how they're predicting what kind of what kind of clothes you might like. Um, feedback, listening to call center employees, giving them a feedback on, all right, you are a little annoying there. You're a lot annoying there. You're um, here's how you can improve in real time. Improving in real time is fascinating. I actually have a much larger study. We don't have to talk time to talk about about how people are improving playing chess through immediate coaching. Oh, no, that's a bad move. And that's a much better to know in that moment where you can take it back and think about it and, and try and assess different paths versus the model that we're used to in school, which is we teach you a bunch of stuff, then we, we give you an exam, and then we disappear for a week while we slog through your rating, and then we give it back to you. Stuff like this is the idea of real-time feedback is, is fascinating. All right. Um, engineering design, I'm going to go a little quicker here. So there's a bunch of examples here, but Generative tools are showing up everywhere, and it was hard for me to find, you know, to cut down this list. Not hard to find them. This is an audience check to see. Somebody ought to at least say, hey, you're already there, buddy. What are you talking about? But no, you didn't. Okay, we'll, get, we'll treat you like a hostile audience here. What if I wanted to get fit? We have two options here. Now, I always about the options here. I could hire a personal trainer, and this is if I was Oprah or Jay-Z, that's what I'd do. Anytime I was ready to exercise, I would have that person ready to go whip me into shape whenever I decided to quit eating chips on the couch, right? Um, this is with my lifestyles of the rich and famous approach. <laughs> Not practical for me. Yeah, push up's easier. Um, option B, you just came out, product from Peloton. 
they'll put a device in your home that will watch you and say, that plank looked bad. You said you were going to do 12 sit-ups? That looked like four to me. You know, th <laughs> that's what this tool is doing. That's the I'm, tool. I didn't mean to call him a tool. Uh, <laughs> that's what this person is doing. Um, and we can have this done uh, by a technology uh, in the in our living room, ready whenever we're ready to peel ourselves off the couch. Um, little device and come on. Exactly, it could happen. <laughs> See if, if they work hard. The difference here is the goal is not to get a predictive model for the machine to do something. It's for me to improve, and I think that's a, a distinction that we've lost um, up to now. Um, and I'm pretty excited about it. This interview we did with Sanjay Nichani, who is no longer at Peloton, of course. Um, but real-time feedback and metrics-driven accountability, that's what they're trying to do and put that in place for people. I'm guessing this product doesn't work great the first time. I bet it doesn't work the great the second time. One of my favorite quotes from our podcast is uh, Gina Chung. You said, the first day is the worst day. Because these systems get better and better over time and improve. The first day that this person was a personal trainer, they probably didn't do a great job either. We don't fire people their first day on the jobs because they're not perfect. And I think that's what's going to happen with these technologies. All right. The, the point here, too, is that this is not where we're trying to teach the machine to do something for us. We're not trying to have the machine imitate and do what a human can do. We're having this, the machine help us get better. All right. This isn't hypothetical. Adam's my son. I love Adam. If you're listening, Adam, I love you. Um, Adam and I, during the pandemic, assembled a Lego chess set. And it was really cool and fun. We had a great bonding experience. I showed him how the pieces move, and I was the cool dad, and he thought I knew something. And, um, you know, we're playing, and I, I'm letting him take back moves. I'm saying, all right, Adam, are you sure? You know, think about what I'm going to do if you do that, all right? We had a great time. Suddenly, I started having to pay attention because he's getting better. You know, I can't be sort of zoned out and halfway paying attention. Then the little snot disappears for a month or so, and he finds this online site that is a uh, AI-based web uh, chess training. And he goes through a bunch of puzzles and exercises, has a bunch of critique done of his games, and the story got worse. <laughs> this was so fun when I'm saying, oh, Adam, are you sure? Do you want to say And now he's doing the thing, like, Dad, do you, have you thought about that? Are you... And, you know, it actually really kind of is a sad story because we don't play much anymore because he's just got... I like to think that I could, if I would go spend time, get better, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, but the point here is that this is an exercise where he went, he didn't hire an instructor, he didn't hire, he didn't play with any other body, body else. He went online and found some tool that helped him get better. That's big. Um, are we still qualified to teach? Um, I'm going to give this a little short shrift in the end of, in the interest of time, but there's a giant contest for computer vision that's happened over the last, let's say, 2010 to 2016, where it kind of shut down. You'll see why in just a second. But what happened was they were using computer vision algorithms to recognize pictures. The challenge was, here's a database of 14 million pictures. What is in this picture? And these were the submissions in 2010. Huge dispersion, lots of different techniques. A lot of code written that said something like, I'm kind of extrapolating or being intuitive here, but, you know, if it has four legs, then it's you know, a table or is it a cat? Well, if it's furry, then it's a cat. If it has a tail, you know, it's just this giant thing. And it's an Internet success story because what happened was after the first contest, all the people here who did well, everybody looked at what they were doing and learned. Right? Well, that's great. That's the point of a contest. Um. But in 2012, something fun happened. Alex Dett, uh, out of the University of Toronto, the guy came up with a deep learning approach. And this was, hey, I don't really know what's happening. We have this system that will mimic a human brain, and we're just going to throw it and teach it repeatedly, show it the same pictures over and over again until it learns. And out of the gate, Alex took him behind the woodshed and spanked him. Next year, we had a few, a couple holdouts trying to you know, cling to the prior thing, but everyone saw what Alex did and pushed up the accuracy to the mid-80s. By 2014, everyone had given up on the old approach and gone to this deep learning approach. These deep learning approaches are exactly what's behind ChatGPT uh, and these other models. Um, we have a little dispersion here happening in 2015 where I think people are exploring, trying to do something different. You know, hey, let's try something, see if it works. If it doesn't work, 
let's try something else. And that one did work. And so we're, we're exploring and learning. Um, but here to your point about errors, this error rate right now on this network is about 3.6%. Um, human error and looking at the same images is about 5%. Um, and the difficulty comes down to if you have a picture of a mushroom, uh, these models will call it an enoki, which is a type of mushroom. And the right answer might be mushroom. So it's, it's, it's more than right. All right, so we're not really still qualified to teach people. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh -huh. Are you are you a robot or are you a human? Yeah. Yeah. They can't. Yeah, I don't think those are those are not going to sit around for much longer. I'm really kind of surprised they're still being used because I, I don't. You're going to give me on a tangent here, but much like copy protection, I think it's a tax on the honest and it doesn't affect the dishonest. And what I mean by that is that if you're trying to get past these things, you've got a system that will beat these things. These, if you're trying to beat the captchas. You've got a system that will beat them. If you're just trying to get into the website, you're getting annoyed, uh, right? So it's it's not doing a good job of separating out the the miscreants from the non miscreants. Um, actually, there's a whole different tension like hatches about like uh, anyway. Let, okay, let's keep going. All right. The second thing is I think that we need to move away from this model of directed learning. I'm I'm really big on a directed learning model. Uh, this is uh, again ChatGPT. Uh, sorry, uh, DALI, which is a different diffusion model. Uh, ask it for a professor, a college classroom, bald male. Um, that hurts, but that's that's uh, <laughs> that's part of why we feel like these images are right is they reinforce the stereotypes we have in our mind. And if if it violates a stereotype, then it doesn't seem right, and that's a whole giant problem. Um, but what I used to have in class was a very narrow distribution. Some students would come in. They were mostly gathered around this mean. I would teach in this blue band here, and there were some advanced students that knew too much. I was going to bore them. There were some students that didn't really have the background. I was going to lose them, and I was just trying to pick up the middle, you know, just trying to get that sweet spot because um, I have to teach the same to 35 people and 40 people. What's happening now, I think, is people, students, are, we're seeing more and more dispersion in students. We're losing more people because my... <laughs> The, the, what I can do in class doesn't change, but the, the tables I'm losing and the tables are getting bigger. And so it's an argument for personalized learning, personalized learning at scale. And uh, there's a whole philosophy here about the pedagogy of the oppressed from Paulo Freire. Um, it, it rails against a banking model of education where we treat students as empty vessels and like I, the learned professor, tell them everything rather than co-learning. I think... Artificial intelligence gives us a chance to move towards co-learning individuals. It worked well beyond the classroom. I don't know if you watched The Good Place. This is a, a, an episode where Chidi on the, on the left is breaking up with his girlfriend, Simone, on the right, and he's trying to figure out a best way to break up with her. He goes to a virtual reality simulation and he breaks up with her like 100,000 times, all trying different ways because he doesn't want to hurt her feelings. This is an episode where he hands her a puppy. At the same time, he says he's breaking up. He hands her a puppy, and it, and it turns out actually, for the you know the moral of the story is there's no good way to break up with someone. But the point is, Chidi was able to practice a difficult task, and it's hard to practice difficult tasks. I have a daughter who's about to start driving. I would like her to go through a lot of simulations. I would like for her to have near wreck experiences or wreck experiences without actually having to have wreck experiences. There's a surgeons who separated conjoined twins and they did it in a, in a digital simulation to practice a bunch of times because you don't want to practice on a bunch of twins because one they don't come along it's not like you get hundreds a day to practice on and you don't want to get them every single one of them right anyway it goes beyond the classroom so that's something we can learn from a machine but i want to tell you the story about the fosbury flop which is a high jump so <clears throat> dick apparently he died recently dick fosbury Everybody before Dick Fosbury was running up to the bar and jumping forward over it. He started jumping backwards over it and went higher. People saw him doing that, and within two years, every single high jumper was going backwards over the bar. We saw an improvement. It diffused through the population, and people, everybody jumps backwards now. Carve, this is a, we'll put a sensor in your ski boot and tell you how you're skiing and tell you to put more weight here and more left weight, and it'll do it in real time in your ear. What's going to happen is if somebody's going to do something crazy on their skis, Carve is going to be watching and listening, 
and most of it will result in yard sale crashes of ski equipment on the slopes, but something will work. Something will be amazing. And when it is amazing, the machines are going to notice. And then tomorrow, it's going to be telling all the rest of us how to do that better. And I think about this particularly with language. You know, if you're learning language, um, you might have a good teacher that over 30 years gains a lot of ways of, you know, teaching well. And, but if they discover some way that people are learning language better, these people who do Duolingo have an ability to do it at scale that's unprecedented and individualized. I think they're, they're having an amazing product right now. Um, heavily, heavily used of uh, artificial intelligence. Point five, we're already good at teaching the machines. We need to think about what happens next. All right, we're kind of running long. We'll go a little quicker here. Um, my last point is more about things I'm worried about. And this is Janice, the two-faced guy. So I'm going to be a little bit two-faced here. We can have AI tools do a ton for us. And that's awesome. They can get rid of the dirty, dull, dangerous that we do. They can get rid of the tedious. They can get rid of, they can give you a, a draft of a document first. Um, at the same time, I'm worried about how we're going to progress from the basics. If you don't know how to write a bad document, do you ever learn how to write a good document? Um, and I, we don't know the answer to that yet. We don't have an understanding of the long-term effects. I worry that this is becoming a race to mediocrity. We lose skills. This is a sextant. It was on the image here. There's a sextant upstairs here. Anyone here can navigate by the stars of the sextant? I'm guessing no. We don't, we've lost that skill. And I think it's okay. GPS works better. Uh, we were talking about hand crank cars. Apparently that, that car back there in 1912 has a rear crank. Instead of an electric ignition, it has a rear crank. Anyone here know how to do that? It's okay. It's, you break your arm, apparently, doing it. Um, gear shift, can people drive a stick? Yeah, okay, see, now that feels good here. That's going to be the same thing here in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bit longer here. You're, you're thinking, oh, no, I could drive better than the machine. It's going to get you eventually. We lose these things. Like, we, if you look back, there's just things. Can do. I, I have tried very hard to start a fire by rubbing sticks together. I, I put, actually, I even got my cordless drill out to spin the stick for me, and I still can do it. And I mean, I'm guessing most everybody could for a while. We, we're losing some skills. It's not clear which skills we want to lose and which ones we don't. And I'm not sure if this these technologies are giving us a head start or they're helping us be mediocre. We have to figure that out. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. What do you think about the idea of us not losing necessarily specific skills, but like the ability cognitive to ability? So like there was a study done on London cabbies pre and post CPS, and they like literally had different brain structure and I think it amounts of great matter. So like they you literally have less cognitive ability because you don't spatially navigate regularly in the same way that we do. Yeah, and tie that back to my Chad GPT chart that showed who the young people were using this. Oh, sorry. Um Using these technologies changes the way we think in general, fundamentally. And it's not a specific skill. It may be a more general thing. And her example was London cabbies whose brains are different before and after GPS. The point here is that we may be not just losing the ability to do a skill. We may be kind of losing some general skill abilities. I don't think we know. I don't think we know that yet. Um, but, I, but I worry about that, and especially with the age distribution that that Pew chart showed. Um, it's all changing really fast. Really, really fast. Sorry, is that a hand or is that a... Uh, according to me, you might uh, want to touch on one thing. Ned, to some degree, we've been talking here, you've been talking about, like, in AI or a particular instance. But now you have several hundred of these guys going at once and coming up with slightly different, perfectly good answers to the same question. Is there... Is, is this problematic? And I imagine people ways it happens me, uh, just in, in, in what this, these various tools, what they think I am, uh, they, what they think my phone number, what they think my address is. Yeah, I mean, the, the, we get a lot of answers. If we ask about something, we get a different answer, too. So yeah, I'm not sure that that's necessarily an AI-specific thing, that they all give different answers. I mean, yeah. And it may be good if more things are thinking. I mean, that, that's a positive. Um, 
it's changing fast. We can get these benefits pretty quickly. We can scale, we can correct. Actually, I really like stories where tools find bias and do, because then we can change it. Like there's a ton of bias happening. There's a ton of like hiring and racial and misogynistic bias in our society and the machines didn't create it. We created it. And the machines would give us a chance perhaps to correct that at scale if things are in an algorithm. On the same things, things can explode before we know what to do with them. And I think I'm worried about the pace of that. Um, data science is the sexiest job in the 21st century. Tom is still a professor at Babson, so that's good. Um, <clears throat> but is philosophy next? Should we be philosophers and not? Are you okay, Bob? Do we, do, what do we, should we, I'm acting. I was just checking in with Frederic here about the online audience and whether there are questions. Oh, okay. All right. Right. If you, we can, we got, well, I got one more concern here and then we can kind of wind down. Um, I have a big concern about large technology companies that benefit from this scale. Um, the cool thing is that we get crazy valuable tools for almost free. We can go to chat GPT and use it for free, even though it costs, you know, millions, hundreds of millions. I think Microsoft's investment was a billion dollars. That's cool that we can get to access to these tools, but it's, we have very little control or knowledge about what's happening behind the scenes in these tools. Who's, who's running them, whose objectives that they're, that they're after. Um, we had a great example in the 80s of Sabre's technology where they put technology in every travel agent and it happened to show all their, their American Airlines tickets first and there was a giant uh, lawsuit about that. Um, I'll go quicker on that. I think there are disturbing parallels. In 1906, Upton Sinclair wrote a book called The Jungle about the meatpacking industry in Chicago and meatpacking was gross. Um, I think we might be similarly horrified if we knew what was happening inside technology companies right now. We don't know what's behind these algorithms. We don't have any good ways of finding them out. We faced similar things before. We solved it with food. We put in the Food and Drug Administration. We put in the CDC. We put in restaurant inspectors. We, we don't hear a lot of news about bad food. In fact, when E. coli outbreaks happen, it's news because it's so unusual. Um, we've done it with nuclear, um, biotech. We, we've done some things. So we, we have a way. We, have, we are not new to this. Um, we can restrict, there's, there's lots of things we can do. No, have to have a preferred, have to be perfect. We can, we can change how these technologies play out here, but I think we need more transparency to be able to do that. We do that with CPAs who go in and audit the books of a company, and then we trust the CPAs, and so then we buy the company, right? They're, they're mechanisms. I don't, I don't know which one's perfect, but um, it's hard. The digital, digital hard, digital makes things hard. And the big question here is not so much about what we can do, we can do a lot. It's a question about what we should do. And that's fundamentally, fundamentally changing here. And so that's my final point is that when we combine an agnostic tool with hidden backroom processes happening at speed and happening at scale, we're likely to end up with trouble. That Bob feels like a good closing argument. I have a bunch of content here. If you're curious about it, if all these stories come from something, but that is a good place to stop and get grilled by the online audience. So I've got the second mic. I have to stand behind the speaker. We get feedback. Um, we've learned this is our first um, hybrid event hosted with the GBH Forum Network. And one of the things we've learned is that um, the online audience couldn't hear your questions because you weren't speaking into the sound system. I should have repeated That's that. That's Right. So, um, sorry to the online audience for that technical error on our part, because um, we could have prepared for that. Um, there were a couple uh, questions that were submitted in advance that I'd like to pose to you. Uh, one is, um, how can young professionals get ahead in the AI space? Uh, ahead is a tough. Can I? <laughs> um, everyone's doing this. You know, so that getting ahead is really difficult. Um, but most of these technologies are relatively easy to access. You, you went to Chad GPT and played with it, right? Mm -hmm. And you know more about Chad GPT than you did before. You, you won't get wise with the sleep in your eyes, right? I mean, that's the, the classic love rush lyric. Um, you, you gotta have to play with these technologies. You gotta have to, to use them. And, and so much of this that I'm excited about is open source and free and available on the internet. Now, usually it's limited in some way in terms of like number of times you can do it or whatever, but it's 
not a serious limit that's going to stop. So I would start playing. Great thing about an online question is that they can't complain about trans. And uh, Tommaso, or excuse me, Sharon, posed the question, as a teacher, I'm wondering, how do you check if a student is using AI to do his or her work? And um, the follow-up was, what impact does AI have on education? Yeah, so I'm, I'm big on that, uh, or I'm concerned about that. I think there's a couple of different ways to answer that question. If you think about a calculator, let's, let's make an analogy to a calculator. If you're teaching someone addition, that you need to prevent use of a calculator because they got to learn to do the, the addition on their own. But once you get to an upper level class or statistics, there's no value in having the person manually do it. Might as well give them a calculator. So I think, you know, when I you know, hear a question like that, I immediately want more context about what they're trying to teach and what they're trying to, to learn. I mean, it may be perfectly viable as a tool. And when I teach a class in machine learning, people can use it to do whatever they want to. And I think that's part of the skill that I'm now trying to teach is how do you take the output from some tool like this and improve it and make it better? I think that's the important, but that may not fit for whatever the context is. I'm wondering if you've found yourself suspicious that the work that you've assigned to students of your own is coming back not having been done by the student. No, actually I'm not suspicious because I'm okay with it. Like in my context, I'm okay with it. That it's completely fine. What I what I worry about is that they don't know how to get a better I, I can see the the output from Chad GPT mm -hmm. or the copilot that is stopped there and it doesn't work. And they don't recognize that it doesn't work and they don't recognize how to improve it. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think we have to work. Let me twist the question to answer something that I want to answer, which is um I think we're we're missing out on opportunities for if you think about uh, experiential learning can happen in four ways. If you go back to Kolb's theory of experiential learning, concrete experience. You can practice by doing things. You can have reflective observation. People can watch you do it. You can get feedback. You can experiment. So there's lots of different ways that we can learn. And I think there's a lot of ways we can map use of AI into each one of those four ways. We can put people through simulations. We can then use the tools to critique them. We can use the tools to understand better what they know and what they don't know diagnostically. There's a lot of opportunity here could be also kind of a game of intellectual tennis where you hit the ball in the form of a question, it gets hit back in the form of an answer, you realize maybe my question wasn't so good, so you improve the question and hit it back, and yeah. you keep nice. challenging the student who is now empowered with the modern AI technology. You have to up your game as the questioner, as right. the challenger. Yeah, um, Socrates, rebirth. So. Um, I'm going to walk over here and just see if there are any questions that are in the um, chat on the Zoom call. Um, there are. I'm hearing a nod. There are two. One, one sec. Anyway, I think all this stuff's fascinating. Obviously, you know, you can tell I could talk about it for a long time. Okay. I've got a lot of stuff. A couple questions from the online audience. Um, from Jacqueline. What about the use of AI in social media and politics to feed misinformation? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, interesting timing for that. Um, uh, let me flip that. What about the use of AI for detecting misinformation? I mean, I, I think that, again, that comes back to the tool is agnostic, and we've got to figure out how to use it. Um, I, I think the ability to do, to, to, do, to do evil at scale is unprecedented. Now, the ability to do good at scale is unprecedented as well, and I think that's on us to to push hard on that. Yeah, my question that is the follow-up to the um, audience member's question is, how can we use AI to rebuild trust? Yeah. I mean, so you got to think about like misinformation, marking, investigating things for you, finding the sources. I mean, these are all ways. That, I mean, what would you do to trust a piece of content right now? Is you'd go find, you'd go read. Well, these are the things that the tools can do for you as well. Find, read, synthesize. Yeah. And the other question online I can actually answer, are there different levels available of ChatGPT free and for a fee? And the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're, they're recovering their money on some things. Um, one of my concerns, but well, I don't know. Let's don't get into that. It's a broad broadcast live stream. Um, audience questions. I'm going to give you a mic so if we can fix the earlier problem. So please pause and wait till you receive the mic. What do you think about the New York Times uh, uh, lawsuit 
uh, basically they said they generated all of this intelligence and, and facts um, yeah. and they want in on the gains that these corporations are getting. Really fast thing. There's a huge question here about whether we're eating our seed corn. So like the idea of eating your seed corn is if you eat your seed corn, then you don't have corn to plant next year, right? Well, by analogy, if we have taken away, if we've sucked up all the computer knowledge from Stack Overflow and Coding's websites, who's going to add that content later on for the next generation of tools? And I think the New York Times um, use of, of content is exactly that sort of thing. That's a, in the second period of the game, where's that content going to come from? And I think that's something that we, beyond just the New York Times, have to worry about is Okay, let's say we consider it completely fair to do that. Well, then what happens next year when the New York Times doesn't doesn't produce content? Oh, we got to think this thing through more than just one iteration. Some things that are legal individually are not always legal at scale. For example, let's think about surveillance technologies. A policeman can stand outside your house and watch you, right? That's been legal. Surveillance has been legal forever. But now they have the ability to surveil at scale and at speed, to surveil everyone all the time, constantly, no bathroom breaks. Um, our laws and infrastructure were really built for that thinking. Because what's happened is the cost structure has changed dramatically. And we got to figure, I mean, if I had some great answer to that, I wouldn't be standing here in the, in the little mill. It's a, it's a big problem. I agree, I agree with the problem. <laughs> Hi. So I um, I took some AI-related courses, including one, Artificial Neural Networks, and it was pretty fascinating. And then the AI winter happened. So in other words, I took these courses in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the one hand, it, you know, I have a little bit more informed sort of uh, look at what technically what these systems are doing. Uh, but on the other hand, I asked myself, why did I waste my time? Like, if I'd known the AI winter was going to happen, I might not have bothered because, you know, I worked in technology, thought I needed to know it. And that's just sort of a lead into the idea of an expert in AI and society. And, you know, you see the headlines and it's like every headline is expert tells you what you need to know about AI. And I just want to ask the, es the expert, how many human civilizations have you led from pre-AI to post-AI yeah. that you use to develop your expertise? Well, unfortunately, I think your your criteria for selecting an expert is not going to leave you with a lot of people in your pool to listen from. So if that's your, your criteria, then I don't think you're going to get anywhere. Um, well, I think one thing that's happened since the AI winter is that, well, three things. We've had massive amounts of data, of data available that we just didn't have before. We have massive ability to process and finally, we have mass ability to communicate that, those results. And those three things have all come together. And again, you know, back to my picture of Grog, Zog, the fire discoverer, really hard to know how those three things were going to come together to give us this rebirth. And it's really hard to know what that next winner might, might end up being. But I don't think your criteria for expert. I think you're going to have to relax that a little bit or else you're not going you're not, you're not to find any expert. In, in the media, they're portraying that. As yeah, I mean, I find it always funny in in, uh, in in job search, you know, where people want X, you know, 14 years experience with chat GPT right now. I mean, it's, but I think that's in some sense liberating that that you're not behind on, you know, people are not behind on these things. Uh, actually, here's a statistic that I, as an expert, can quote. Zero percent of the world were born knowing how to use these technologies. And, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not going to cite my source on that, but it's all learned. And it's all, anything that we know about chat GPT has been learned in the last, you know, year or so. Now, people built off of understanding like yours of technologies and neural networks before that. And so there's a head start there. Um, but it's all happening quickly and there's time to, time to become an expert. Good. Doc. Y'all are taking it easy here. Hi. What do you think of attempts to regulate, uh, like the European Union's uh, attempts? And uh, will they be successful? What, you know? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough to regulate any technology. Um, one of my 
in my past life, before I was a professor, I worked with the United Nations and the Weapons Inspectors Program. That's a, that's a way that we tried to regulate uh, atomic, and you know, we've not had a significant atomic explosion since uh, you know 1945. So, you know, there there's there's some degree of confidence that the things we do to regulate can work. Now, in the case of that organization, we shared information about safe uses of power reactors. We save use safe uses of irradiation of, of corn and, you know, seed crops. So there's a, 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 a carrot and stick approach there. You also had the inspection program, which was more of the stick approach. Um, what's m somewhat difficult about these is that there are, um, these technologies don't require the infrastructure that, for example, nuclear does. Uh, they don't have the physical presence that, for example, food inspectors do. You know, so it's not like we're first time we're trying to regulate a difficult technology, but on the other hand, there's some things about this technology that are make it particularly challenging and quick. Um, but I don't think we can just sort of like roll our, you know, you know, say, oh gosh, we, we can't do anything about it. Um, regulation is tough because it ignores national borders. In this particular case, we don't have a good customs, you know, border control for digital goods. Um, we can work against that. Um, some of the things we've heard about regulation, for example, oh, everybody, let's just pause. Well, it's no secret that the people wanting to pause were the people who were ahead. <laughs> like, I, I'd want to pause if I were ahead too. Um, and it's also so many incentives for people to defect from a pause like that. Um, but I think, you know, to the other point of combining it with speed is these things are happening so quickly. Even if we did get some regulation in place, it's not clear to me that it would be effective for more than a year. And we've not seen regulation move that fast. And we still think about copyright the way we thought about Gutenberg Press uh, versus digital media. Um, we're, we lag. That's not very uplifting, sorry. I didn't know the grilling was going to be such a big part of this. My question is about the, the term deep learning. Um, my understanding is that basically the example you gave us with the, forming the sentence about the bank, deep learning is basically doing that with a really, really large number of repetitions. So um, isn't it actually the opposite of deep? Uh, so no, actually the deep, the deep has to do with more about the cre the models create hidden layers. Uh and this this goes back to your your you know the original models in 1980. Um, it's originally modeled off the brain, so you have a bunch of inputs that go in, and then you have a bunch of synapses that. And this gonna I don't know anything about brain, but like they fire and they get active, and you learn from those, and then those trigger other neurons, and then those trigger other neurons. What's deep about these is the layers of neurons that they're creating. To make an analogy. When we train some a model to pick a good employee through deep learning, we may not give it something like an uh, attribute like race or gender because we want to not include that in the model. But what we find are these hidden deep layers learn what the race and the gender uh, are of people from that. Um, and so there might be a node in there that is like male-female uh, that's that's learned, its prior layer has taught it how to recognize male-female. The next layer then learns how to use male-female. And so even if male-female was not in the original model, it picks it up from the college people went to, the sports that they played in college, the activities that they do. Um, and so when you're talking about the deepness, the deepness has to do with the construct of the model layers, uh, not so much the depth of repetition, the shallow depth. I'll draw a picture too. Okay. I'd be shocked to learn I have a slide for that later on. I mean, it, yeah, makes more sense if you think about the layer. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on one thing. It almost seems like, you know, many organizations, we know they're trying to invest into AI ML, you know, but sometimes it feels like some organizations like not necessarily identifying what problem they're trying to solve, what's the use case as opposed to let's invest and see if it sticks. So I think all of the above are correct here. Um, so I have some great, great quotes, actually a great quote from um, Matt Evans, who again, at the time, was the, in the charge of uh, the Airbus production. Um, he's since moved on. But um, 
his quote, when I asked him about why do you invest in artificial intelligence, his quote was, we don't invest in artificial intelligence. We, we, that's not, that's not our objective. Uh, we were trying to solve a problem. Um, actually, we were Google an article with me and George Westman and Kiar Fernando. Um, we just published, um, earlier this month about exactly that sort of starting with the problem thing. Um, now that's true, but there's also some investigation and exploring. Um, and so one of the things we did in one of our surveys a few years ago was we asked if people research first and then did, or did, and then figured out what happened and which path led. Cause we were thinking one of those paths would work and it turns out to your just do something approach, both, both paths were viable. You know, people can learn by either trying some stuff, figuring it out, failing. Um, you can't know to apply artificial intelligence to a problem unless you know something about artificial intelligence, but you can't at the same time be looking for artificial intelligence uh, to solve, you know, now I have this hammer, where's my nail? Um, did an interview with uh, a guy at Orange Theory, who is also not there, <laughs> but in, <clears throat> in the trend. And I asked him what was his proudest moment about in using artificial intelligence. And he said, when I use logistic regression, which is not artificial intelligence. He found a tool that worked quickly and solved his problem. And they didn't crank up the machinery and moved on to the next problem. And it was very problem focused. There's also a lot of marketing around it. What's the cutting edge? Cutting edge. Ooh. Um, yeah, so there's a whole, um, maybe I can kind of shift this a little bit to talk about a concern, which is that it's happening largely in industry versus academia, whereas a lot of technology, uh, basic technology happened in academia and in research institutions in the past, but the money and scale required to do this is frequently now coming from um, corporations. Um, you think about things like OpenAI, AI. Uh, they used to be open. Now they're they're closed. They got a lot of funding from Microsoft. We you think about the names, the Googles, the Facebooks, Metas. The, these are the people behind these big models because it's taking a ton of computational power to do these. Things. And that's something that you know, rather than specifically telling you like who, who's exciting, I think that's more of a general trend. Of uh, there's a great science article about um, how that shift has moved. Um, Neil Thompson and Ahmed have read, read about that. So it's a big trend. And we, we don't know how to, we don't know what to do about that. Or is it a problem? Is it not a problem? We don't, we don't really know. It's just not how things have happened in the past. Um, the, so you hear a lot about AI and my question is, uh, is this mostly uh, something taking place in the United States and is there a lot of patent activity behind it or is it just global? Actually, it's highly global and um, uh, Asia, huge, and China in particular have big initiatives towards this. So it's not even clear that, you know, I think we're sitting in a U.S. centric world here. Uh, it's not clear to me that we're, while we generate, we generate a lot of headlines and the headlines we read are about our technologies. Uh, it's, it's happening everywhere. Actually, one of the best open source, uh, models about, uh, to compete with GPTs comes out of France at the moment. If, you, if you're curious, actually, it's always kind of curious. There's a Hugging Face has a website where they rank the accuracy of model. Maybe this gets into your errors. Errors and accuracy thing is um, they've got a rank of all the current models that are out there and how they're faring in terms of uh, uh, accuracy on text, I believe is what their metric is. And it changes. I can't keep up with it. Hugging Face. In your uh, co-learning example, you talked about these carved boots, and I've seen ads for them on YouTube, and I suspect they're not capable of giving the kind of insights outside of the box that you suggested they might be able to. That's not exactly my question. My question is more that people are attaching AI to all sorts of products. Powered by AI. So is there anything we can do about that is the sort of trivial question, but the deeper question is, is AI even an accurate term for any of these technologies? Are any of them ever like within a light year of being intelligent? Man, then you're going to get down into what is intelligent, which is a, is a disaster. Well, pra uh, pragmatically in terms of human I expectations that, I, when they hear it. I think that some of these things are truly amazing technologies. Now that's not to say that everything that says powered by AI is, um, 
And you know, there's a joke about it's, it's AI in the PowerPoint deck and machine learning and, you know, in engineering that, that, that exists mostly for marketing. And actually one of the questions we have out in a survey that's we're distributing right now that we'll publish the results in November is to what degree is all this attention distracting from progress on important stuff? Is this a shiny object that's luring people away or is this something that's helping lure people towards some, some goal? But I think, you know, I'm, a, I'm skeptical about things in general. I mean, that's kind of my nature, but, um, I do think that some of the things that, that models can do are amazing. Now I've been working with some uh, x-rays. I know nothing about x-rays and I've been working with some image data and I cannot look at that x-ray and tell what is a problem and what is not a problem. And even I am able to train models to get 75, 80% accuracy in detecting a problem through this tool. And I know nothing about, I, I literally as a human cannot see that. Now I mean, probably some actual trained medicine person could, you know, could do that. Uh, but I think that's pretty amazing that it can learn uh, those things and, and what look like grainy images to me. I think we need to get specific about individual things if you want to, you know, case by case. It's baseball season soon, and I have one thing to add about baseball <laughs> before we wrap. Um, AI, AI is a label that gets slapped on anything, it seems. Mm -hmm. And is AI one thing like a beagle or many things like a dog? And part two is how can I tell whether it's really AI or just technology so complicated I can't tell it from magic? Yeah, I mean, so you're, uh, you, you said beagle versus dog. I mean, let's, I don't know where we want to go with the kingdom, biome, class, order, family, genus, species here, but I would go a lot further up the, up the taxonomy to yeah. maybe kingdom and phylum before I think about where the word AI fits. It's, it's nowhere near those leaf toads. Um, and, you know, is it, just, is it AI? Are there many AI? Yeah, there, there are many different tools doing many different things, many different, you know, there's text-based, there's image-based, there's sound-based, there's just a world of different things that we all lump into this. And so that makes it really hard to define uh, what is and what is not. Um, but before we had a survey, we tried to put a definition, we tried to agree amongst ourselves within the survey about a definition. We never get there. We just had to use, we had to use the Oxford Dictionary's definition which we didn't like, but it was at least something that got us out of continuously debating what was and was not. For, there's a certain pragmatic marketing aspect of technologies that I think is fine. I mean, it, people would be dumb not to sort of embrace this funding and marketing that comes along with it. Um, that doesn't mean that everything that they're doing necessarily fits under that umbrella. Um, but we did that before 10 years ago with word analytics and data. And I'm guessing there'll be a new word, new word in, in a month or two, or a year or two. Yeah, actually, that's kind of, yeah, it's good. I would not want to be in charge of putting that label on something, um, GMO, non-GMO, AI, non-AI. Wow. I don't think I want to see our government resources going towards, towards the creation of that agency. Because actually, by the time they labeled it, it would change too. I'll, I'll drop in the, the baseball reference. Um, uh, this past weekend, someone was here and told me that a mother load of film of old baseball games has been discovered and is being digitized. I mean, hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of film of baseball games played in the early eight, uh, 20th century. And... Um, AI is being used to review all the footage, to identify who's in it and what happened. So the, they're, it's able to figure out who the players were, what position that they're playing. And when something happens, a pitch is thrown, a ball is hit, uh, who the ball is going to, how it was fielded. So the statistics are being reconstructed about these old games for which there are no physical, there are no written records and so they're able to and 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 they're able and computers through image recognition technology you know parsed with some identification characteristics are able to reconstruct all of this that 
humans probably w would never be able to get to in time. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting, arcane, not important, but interesting um, way of a, a, an application of artificial intelligence. But in that case, the humans could do it if they had the time and resources, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, so to, to do the writing that... To, to the questions about do we call this AI or not, it is, gets, it's really tough to say, but it certainly allows it at scale. You think about, uh, actually, I'm looking here at the World Wildlife Fund. They got cameras pointed out there looking at trying to find critters, and they identify the critters. That's true that they could send a whole bunch of people out into the field to identify those critters, but if they can have the machine do it, that they can do it at scale. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I'm happy. <laughs> You talked about uh, these algorithms consuming their own seed. Is anyone doing this experiment where they just take vast amounts of ChatGPT output Put it and feed in. it back into the model for generation after generation after generation to see what happens? Yeah, I'm not sure the results, but there are some people that are they're doing exactly that sort of exercise of generating some stuff and putting it back in and generating it you know, with our own self-trained models. Yeah, I don't know what the right answer is. Um, I did go to a research presentation today where they were trying to... Uh, and give a shout out to, to Meng. Uh, she was doing a presentation on Zillow and Zillow's algorithms and whether or not this estimate leads to agents, uh, the agents leads to the estimates and how those two are interacting. And um, her evidence was that there are not a lot of sort of amplifier squelch going on in that particular context. But there, I'm sure there's a bunch of other research on that too. Start it up, you could do it too. Models are open. No one's that. No one can be that far ahead of you. The stuff just came out oh, a year ago. That's what's pretty exciting about it. Y'all are y'all got some endurance here. Planes. I don't quite know how to phrase this, but. Um, I know that if uh, a bunch of doctors or so on uh, working on separate things or somewhat similar things get together at a conference and there's an awful lot of uh, com uh, communication between them and learning from one another, uh, do AI machines ever get together? And I mean, is it possible? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, actually, one of the the, the, the trivial examples of that is, is a for adversarial learning. So one AI doing one thing and one AI trying to do the opposite. So as people back here mentioned misinformation. Think about one AI trying to generate misinformation and another one trying to detect it. One trying to generate fake images, the other one trying to detect it. Uh, we've had tons of success with that with gaming. Like here, learn how to play chess. We're not going to teach you how to play chess, but you play against this other machine that also doesn't know how to play chess and play billion games and you learn how to play chess. And what's particularly interesting about the chess example is that these machines discovered the same strategies that people have come up with over you know, the history of human existence here. Now, your, your question was a little broader than, you know, I, I got it very narrow there with one against another in this adversarial uh, learning context. But uh, yeah, you can think about maybe to, to your example of like lots of different people uh, with lots of different opinions coming together. Um, yeah, what would that... What would that look like? I don't know if we, I don't know. But certainly in the microcosm of one and twos, yes. Somebody probably knows a lot more about that than I do. Thank you very much, everyone, for being huh? here tonight. Thanks for coming out in the rain. Thank you. Talk to you next time. Thank you for having me.